So uh, my name is Forrest Mars, and I'm from New York, where I'm the CTO of a Drupal-based startup called Launchit, and we provide a digital publishing platform for the event space, which includes all the, uh, many of the world's largest conferences, expos, and various events. And this session is about getting Twiggy, or getting Twig, depending how you look at it, either getting Twig or getting Twiggy, um, getting Twiggy um, a reference to Twig, the, the new theming layer being kind of an unholy love child of Twig's clean design patterns and Drupal's very weird pre-process system. Um, uh, in particular, the pre-process layer, um, which had an appointment uh, behind the barn uh, for Drupal. I'm going to turn the volume down so I'm not blasting you guys out of there. Um, but somehow, the pre-process layer managed to escape its appointment behind the barn for uh, Drupal uh, 8. Um, and so it's probably not going to get killed off till Drupal 9. It's kind of like that scene in Monty Python, uh, the, uh, the Holy Grail, where they, he brings out the, the, the old man. He's consistent that he's dead. And he keeps saying, no, I'm not dead. That's our pre-process layer. And it is, if you worked with it, very weird. Um, and we're going to explore a notion in the session that, um, let's see, make sure I get that right here, that all templating languages eventually become Turing complete. Um, and this is kind of a variation on a, a Zwinski's law. Um, which states that all programming languages is expand in scope, no matter what their original purpose, until the point at which that they can read mail. Um, and there's a vari variation on this called uh, Furry Goat's Law, which is that all programs, regardless of their original scope, will evolve to the point where they can read RSS. And I think there's even a version of this called uh, Google's Law, which is that all programs which have evolved to the point where they can read RSS and are widely used to do so will simply be killed off. Um, so, so um, in this session, um, this is a, a session about design. It's about the architectural design of Drupal 8, and moreover, how to, impl how to implement your application designs in Drupal 8. Um, and I, I feel like the UK, I've, I've known it for a while, as get a sense that it's kind of one of the design centers of the world. In fact, I was actually, I, I stopped by the Design Museum uh, yesterday. Who, who here has been to your Design Museum? I mean, it's really, really quite, quite nice. In fact, I picked up, um, they have their designs of the year for 2013, which we will give away as some kind of prize. We'll figure out who has the most clever, clever question or, or clever answer or something like that. Um, but we're going we're gonna to take a look at what's in and what's out of Drupal 8, what's gained, what's lost, to make sense of it. You know, not just as kind of a laundry list of functions that you, you can't use anymore or new patterns that you have to learn, but trying to get at a deep understanding of the changing patterns. Not just making it easier, cleaner, more sane, although we'll start there, but why, you know, and how the underlying, you know, shift in patterns will help you make sense and understand better to design and implement sites in Drupal 8. Um, and in this, this sense, it's going to be helpful to look at things from a historical perspective, you know, to kind of see the changes. Um, uh, this here is, um, believe it or not, the very first Porsche ever. This is the Porsche P1, the first car that uh, Fernand Porsche ever manu uh, mass manufactured. I think he made like, something like 12 or 20 of them in 1890. Um, and it's actually an electric buggy. It's an electric-powered car from, it's effectively, a 120-year-old electric car. Um, now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that early versions of Drupal were like an electric buggy and that the new version is, you know, like a fine-tuned uh, German race car. Um, but all I'm saying is, you know, block system. So who, who here knows which version of Drupal the block system went in? Anyone? That was the version that Dries built in his bedroom. In his dorm room. That's, the block system went in in version 1. And we still haven't fixed it in Drupal 8, right? And we'll, and we'll, and, 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 and we'll get to that. Um, so um, we're going to look at today, you know, the design and development process, why Twig was chosen, you know, what are its benefits. Uh, we'll look at the theming engine change specifically and take a, an overview of the theme layer. Um, we'll look at how to build a theme uh, for Drupal 8 and how to upgrade your existing themes, which turns out to be a a more important, more important problem to solve. Um, and we'll look at the way that Drupal 8 is now providing a more structured approach um, to development with structured data output. And the goal, um, whether or not we completely get it in, to have a predictable page model and a sense of separation of content, of content and data and presentation, as well as a separation of the three tiers of logic, that is, presentation logic, 
and business logic and application logic, those two of which are often conflated, right? Oftentimes we think of separating presentation and then you get your back-end logic. But your back-end logic is application logic and business logic, which, which additionally have to be separated. Um, so, and, and we're going to try to answer the question, you know, why? Why, for the love of Drupal, why? Um, you know, and not so much why are we changing. I mean, I, I hope that anyone with any even passing experience with the Drupal theme layer wouldn't have to ask the question why we're changing it. I mean, the, the question really is why was it ever done it like that in the first place. I mean, it's, it's incredibly obfuscated, right? Drupal does not eschew obfuscation. It seems to embrace it. Um, there are all these various levels, and you know, even if you install like the incredibly buggy and memory-intensive theme developer, it's often difficult to find where various, various theme functions are coming from. It's incredibly inconsistent, right? You're, sometimes you're printing, sometimes you're, sometimes you're rendering. Who knows here, you know, by show of hands, you know, when to use markup, when to use a theme wrapper, or when to put it in a render, right, every time. Like, again, it's inconsistent. Now, there are certain rules which certainly do apply, but it's very difficult to, to determine them. Um, and it's also incredibly insecure, right? Um, I mean, it's insecure that you want to drop your database from the theme layer? No problem, right? Um, you, 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 you can do this. Um, in fact, this is actually not kind of like an abstract e example. This is um, a, a real world, uh, this is a real world example of a, 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 a maintainer, a, a core maintainer, did this, dropped her user table as she was preparing a slide on Twig for a session. I mean, so, you know, if a core maintainer can absolutely do these kinds of things, like, what hope do, you know, do, you know, does everyone else have? Um, and, and that's, you know, for people that are like reasonably well-intentioned, and I guess everyone's well-intentioned, but, you know, people, you know, put on the one ring of power that is do anything in a theme layer that's now become Turing complete, and you get what I like to call Bobby Tables theming. So who here is familiar with the XKCD comic here that I've got up here? I mean, it's, it's quite brilliant, right? The, she, she names, she, they call the school calls, and they're like, you know, did, she, did Bobby, did Robert break something? And they're like, well, did you really name your son Robert Tick? close parentheses, semicolon, drop table students? And you're like, yeah, little Bobby Tables, we call them. And they say, well, well, I hope you're happy. You know, we lost all the student records this year. And she says, well, I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. Um, but the, the point is, um, you know, there's kind of a mean power fail law at work here, which is that the more power you provide, um, the more that it will be used to create these, these great fails. And people will, the, the more power you, you give people to do things in the theme layer, they will eventually do everything in the theme layer until the point where they're building an entire application in PHP and putting it in a template of our, or a node. And actually, I've, I've been talk, I was talking about this, you know, I've talked about this over, you know, last year going back and these kind of like the scary bogeyman at the door, you know, that's like, oh, he's the guy that's going to put all that stuff in your theme layer and database calls and everything. Then I, I happen to inherit a site and they're doing it all. I mean, it's, it's, it, this really, really happens. And it's because we allow this, right? It's because we don't have any way of kind of enforcing and, and controlling, controlling patterns. So you, 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 get these you get these insecurities and you get this Bobby Tables theming, this crazy off, off the rails rail stuff. Um, let me get back to my slides here. And so, so you know, other, other things to avoid. You know, there's a lot of things that we, <laughs> we want to avoid. I mean, if you're writing database calls in theme layer, you're doing it wrong, sure. And we can list, you know, myriad other examples of egregious, you know, ignorance of good application architecture, let alone, you know, bad Drupal coding practices. But for the purposes of this talk, we're going to assume that everyone here is fairly far along the path, you know, if not, you know, in every single rule and the reason for it, at least generally in the sense of having a decent idea of what a good Drupal development practice is. Um, so Drupal 8 is being made secure against mistakes, whether they're made intentionally or unintentionally with the best of, you know, intentions. Um, as, as one, you know, outsourced developer said to me, you know, well, we're not hacking the core modules, we're enhancing them. <laughs> no, quite seriously, that's actual. So, um, so, but the, the problem, the problem, you know, is, is doesn't stop there. You know, even if we, like, bracket all of these problems that we've talked about in, in the theme layer and, and the difficulty of learning it, you know, whether, you know, you're just coming to Drupal uh, from some, you know, faraway place and you you're not really grokking the best practices, or whether you're every day trying to learn Drupal coding practices and build your applications better and better. There's so many places to get tripped up with, and even if we put all those aside, you know, there's still the problem of, you know, 
I don't think I, I remember asking Drupal for any markup. Like, what is the markup doing in there in the, in, 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 in the first place? Um, and, and so, and then there's the problem of the theme layer itself. Has, who here has seen John Albin's, you know, fairly, by this point, well-known diagram of the theme system? This, this is the system we're working with. This is the system that we ask people, and, and not just, and, and keep in mind, we're not just asking, like, you know, seasoned Drupal developers to wrestle with this thing, you know, every day. We're asking front-end developers and designers and people that come to it that just want to build a nice application or site, and they're often used to these other frameworks that make it very, very easy, and then we hand them this, right? So, and we, we really ask them to bend over backwards, right? So, so we have a new system that, we're, that is now in Drupal 8, in core for theming, and it's Twig, and Twig effectively gives you the flexibility to bend over backwards when Drupal asks you to. Um, and Twig is, Twig is a, a, a templating a framework, a templating engine that is structurally clean. It is consistent. You know, there is a consistent way of doing things. You don't have to try to guess or figure it out or figure out where things are coming from or when you're printing, when you're rendering. It's easy to use. It's more object-oriented. It's not this, you know, legacy procedural spaghetti that we're just trying to kind of like wrangle back into some, some manageable, like programmatically appealing like, like, uh, system. Um, it has efficient template loading in it and it, it, and it also demuxes the front and back. We get to that separation of pure data coming, coming off the back end and presentation on the front end, right? And, and right now we still have this weird pre-processed stuff in the middle where like you're trying to, trying to match them up, but does, does everyone get, I mean, that we want to have, we want to use, as we make the Drupal, the framework more structured, that we want to have just structured data being passed around until that point where it's handed off of the theme layer. There should be no HTML in there, like, gumming up the works. This should be pure structured data. And this is a project, you know, we, we started in, you know, in Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, and it's really just completion, completion of, of um, you know, a task we started. So, so, so what do we mean when we refer to the Twig engine, right? It, it, the Twig engine is, is, is very simple, right? It's a template parser, so, right? It's going to parse the templates written in the Twig language, and it's going to compile them to PHP, right? And it's going to store them... Where? Well, I would, I would actually love it for it to store, it in, store them in memory, but it turns out, you know, so it's going to store in the file system right in sites, uh, sites default, files, twig. And, if, and, and it's good to know, it's really good to know that it's there because if you ever make, uh, there's a number of changes that you can actually make. I mean, if you thought clearing caches uh, uh, was fun, um, and I'm also, I'm also fond of, you know, you know, not being a member of the cache clearing cargo cult, right? I don't know what's going on in my site, but I will clear caches like those, those friendly people I saw and they come down in the planes and it seemed to work for them. Now, you should always know what, you know, like, specifically what cache you're clearing, right? What, what bin you're targeting. But in many cases, and especially in the theme layer, you're clearing caches quite a lot. Um, you will find in Twig there's uh, many changes you can make that will um, not compile right and they will, they will break with what you have compiled in your file system. So you just want to delete those files that are in uh, in sites, sites file twig and things, things, things will come back. So, so the twig templates are compiled down to, to op code and what's really great is um, that each of these templates is just a static instance, uh, I mean sorry, a stateless instance of a class and any template that you want to have loaded is just a single method call away, right? So you have, the class is already loaded in memory every template is just one method call away. This is why I really would like to see it, the whole thing just stuck in memory to make it super fast. Because keep in mind that performance is one of the trade-offs we're making here, right? Twig is actually very, very efficient, but you know, kind of by the time we get done with it, like wrestling it into the Drupal framework, we actually are taking a small performance, a small performance hit um, that, that I think would be easy to make back up. So the, the templates are cleaner, um, they're super fast, you know, it's secure, there's auto-escaping, which we're still trying to get in, it's, uh, it's a problem because uh, the auto-escaping is automatic except uh, what your auto-escaping isn't, <laughs> right? So are you auto-escaping HTML or JavaScript it makes kind of a big difference. 
Um, and it's, it's, it's quite extensible, right? It's, it's, it's actual you know, class-based object, object inheritance. So you can do things like extending your template. So instead of taking you know, a node file, a node template, and now also I want to have this for, I want to target very specific nodes, and now I updated my node template, so now I have to update, like, if you just have three specific nodes you're targeting for, you know, for a specific node template, you know, you're maintaining that same code in four different places, right? That's insane. So by, by having clean, clean extensibility, it's just a single place to maintain that. And when you, when you, when you load, when you load, because we'll get to it later, you, you're, you're going to load everything that's in the, in the parent template, and it's going to, um, unless, you, unless you override it. So the syntax itself is super, super clean. So you have, you have three tags that you're using, print, command, oh, oh, and there's a typo here or not? No, it's not, okay, I'm just making sure. Uh, because you mean, there's always spaces maintained between you know, what's in the tag and the, t and the tag itself. So the print tag is, is very simple. It's a print tag, it, it, you know, aka variable output, it's just bound to a masked implementation or the result of an expression using the generic expression parser, which can either, be, uh, which can either include a filter or a, a function. So implementation masking basically means you do not have to worry anymore about whether you're handling an object or an array. Uh, you can leave that for the core developers to debate hotly, you know, like whether we should be even working with arrays, you know, which are slightly faster or objects which are slightly nicer to work with. But on the front end, you never care about that anymore. It doesn't matter. Could be objects, could be arrays, could be some mix. The implementation is masked. And then a generic, uh, the generic expression parser allows you to set and define complex expression wherever it's allowed. So inside any of those tags, you can, uh, you can use uh, filters, you can use uh, functions, we'll cover. And then the second, of course, you have your command tags, the second one, where you in execute your control functions or your loops. Anything in between, in between the opening and closing tags there with the uh, uh, bracket parentheses will be processed by Twig, and the output is just going to be automatically embedded in the HTML surrounding it. And then comment tags are, well, they're just comments, but we'll get to them later. There's actually an interesting way that we can use them if we're doing template conversions, and we can use comments to kind of keep track of what's been converted and what hasn't. Um, so, for example, then, uh, if we want to, uh, one, of the, one of the main filters that ships with Drupal, um, and a filter is just passing the result of uh, an output variable, which is, you know, bound, a bound variable, through the, the uh, pipe to the name of a filter, in this case, the, trans, the translate filter. So you just pass hello Drupal through there, and that's, that's all you need. Um, uh, then a function below it is um, passing, it, passing an argument. It's kind of um, important, uh, like sometimes people are like, don't quite get the difference, and it's, it's not super, super, super like black and white, but it's anything that's an out, that's a, that's a, that's a, that has output on itself, you can pass into a filter. Functions, you're going to pass arg arguments into, into that to, to produce the output. That's essentially, functions are evaluated as an expression. Uh, they can take one or more multiple arguments instead of passing in a single uh, template, template variable. Um, and filters always operate on valid, valid output. Um, functions operate, it may or may not be valid output, whatever, whatever you're pass it, passing in. So not only is, um, are our templates now more extensible, our theme is more extensible, but Twig itself is incredibly extensible. In fact, if you want to just write your own filters, um, here's an example, and I, I just want to, some caveat, oh, oh, oh well, well, here's, uh, I just had another slide to, to make kind of uh, it clear on, on uh, you know, kind of what works and what doesn't. You know, there's a test through the translate filter, an escaped quote works, double, double quoted string with escaped quote, that should work fine, but then you, you do run into cases with a double quoted string, that's not gonna work, and a single quoted string with an escape, that's gonna fail too. Um, all of this, by the way, you know, subject to, to minor changes. I mean, if you would have asked me two weeks ago, like, pre-process was gone, right? And now, like, like huge change. Like, it's, it's still in. There's still lots of little changes being debated, in fact, in terms of, like, you know, which filters are even shipping with Drupal. So writing your own filter, and again, another caveat here, um, these slides, which I'll have up for you, may not be 100% accurate. There may be little things in there. It's not uh, completely uh, tried and tested for, for each, uh, each version of Drupal. So, for example, you want to create a custom filter, so you create the extension. Uh, you know, we're not going to walk through every line of code here. I want to kind of you know, be a little more, be a little more high level on that, but you, you see you're just creating the function here, the public function, extending, uh, uh, using get filters, and then here we're going to return, return, the, return an array there, um, and then uh, the function itself is really just, you know, the same as used in the Drupal 7 module for pirate talk, right? It's a, a 
Dogo Campbell's like uh, WordPress plugin to turn various things into pirate speak on your site, um, and then you return the public extension and a uh, pirate extension your public function. Having that, you register as a service, um, and again, uh, some of these things do change from alpha to alpha, but it should be pretty stable. Put in your modules, give your module name, put it in a filter folder, define the service. Um, it's not a Facebook service, although there are pirates on Facebook, so that should be uh, pirate twig, uh, pirate extension, pirate filter, pirate twig, twig, pirate extension, and then use it, right? So once you've written that, use that anywhere on your site by simply passing any output or valid output expression through your new filter. Simple as that in a module. Um, and all of a sudden now, on September 19th, all your sites can have Pirate Talk on them. So all of these, well, I shouldn't say all of this because there's three tags, right? Super clean. You've got print, command, and comments. Putting it together with the clean uh, binding to the back end, whatever, objects or array, and you take what is this mess that, and, and, and the lack of white space here is because, why? Because PH template loves to, like, mess with your white space, right? It does not really care it's about white space. And you can end up with, with crap like this that you have to, like, deal with. Um, and even, even if we, like, neatly indented this and tidied it up with white space, it's still a pain, a pain in the ass. So we're going to go from this, which we ask people to, like, do this. This is essentially the exact same thing, right? So if you, if you really want an example of, like, what the sea change here is, like, what we formerly asked front-end developers and themers to deal with, to keep in their heads, to type and copy and paste and deal with all the time, and where we're going, we know, could be no, 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 you know, really no clearer than, 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 that, than that, this example right here. Four links and links, there's a control loop, print a link description, and your loop. Um, so, now that is not necessarily dream markup. Dream markup um, is, um, you know, is kind of the absence of markup, right? It's starting from nothing. I mean, you really don't want, like, someone else's dream in your dream. That can be very confusing. Um, but separate from converting all the core templates uh, in Drupal to Twig um, is a parallel project to, as we're converting the templates, um, and as we're killing off of theme functions and converting any functions remaining to templates, um, or essentially two render arrays that return a rendered variable with the theme function then becoming a private method that render calls, right? So you'll never have to deal with theme again. Um, we're getting rid of those, you know, like, you know, you know, menu links, I'm looking at you, right? And there's, there's tons of example, a block, uh, you know, um, links, my, um, users, I think. I mean, there's just tons of example where there's just output coming off. We want to get rid of, we want, instead of converting all this crap uh, in menu and locale, link and block modules, um, we want to get rid of it. We want to have dream markup, which means start from nothing. Stark should be, well, Stark, right? In fact, should Stark have any, should Stark even have regions in it? Like essentially Stark should, you know, really shouldn't even have regions. You should have pure, pure output coming out with no HTML in there at all. Now, anything you can dream, you can have. Core isn't doing an inception on you by planting the suggestion of markup that wasn't your idea, that didn't come from you, but you're stuck with. Now, how close are we? Well, you know, HTML, HTML twig is done, node HTML twig is not done, block locale link, and a lot of these are actually um, very, very, you know, kind of low-hanging issues that you can jump into the queue, and they're actually set up so that if you're, if you're already doing contribution, you're just getting started contribution, even you're doing, you know, a ladder, such as, um, I forget who's doing that today or tomorrow, there's a ladder screen, you can get in, and it's structured so that you can actually get your feet wet and start doing some of these, some of these, some of these conversions. Um, so that's a little bit about what, you know, what, what, you know, got in. Um, uh, things that didn't get in, when I say, you know, didn't get in, I mean things that we wanted to do in Drupal 8 that we haven't been able to. Um, this is, you know, AKA uh, bad news with pretty pictures. Um, so the princess, who here is familiar with, like, the princess branch, which is essentially um, Sam Boyer's uh, fork of Drupal, um, which uh, essentially it's, panels, right, it's panels everywhere in D8 core, right? Um, so it introduces the concept of a display because, of course, Drupal has no way of separating block assignment from the theme, right? I mean, from anything below the theme, it's just per theme, so you have no way to actually have, I mean, how many layouts does Drupal have, right? It is one layout that just kind of bends like that 
bending over backwards person to like meet all these various cases. So, we, the, so displays are essentially configuration entities that record the arrangement of blocks within a particular layout. And remember, of course, layouts are back to contrib. They didn't, it didn't get in. So, um, but, we, we're, but to get at a predictable page model that's you know, pull-based, not push. And the pull is what? It's context. And you know, it's essentially C tools based, and uh, you know, I mean, C tools and, and, and context module. I think they're incredibly like, like, oppositely named, right? Because C tools actually gives you a way of managing global context, and context module actually will create chaos, um, or at least in most of the sites I've seen it used on. Um, so, so then we create an HTML page object, which is strictly a data object uh, representing a page, and we wanted to have a you know, partial res response class, which is going to return return the HTML, except this doesn't get in either, and so we're left with kind of like a watered-down version of it, which is HTML fragment, um, and blocks still have no context. Now, the problem here is this is not just like layout module, where it's a contrib module that's just going to be widely used. It's, it's such a radically divergent page model, and there's some really sharp edges there in terms of integration, such as asset handling, and how you predict uh, where, what your assets are attached, attached to and how your assets know about them. Because it's one thing to attach assets to routes, right? So a route comes back and you're like, no, what assets do you have? But what about if you have a block and you need to know what, is, what assets are going to be attached to that block, right? I mean, to effectively cache all these things, we need to know what's going to be on the page. And, and one of the reasons to, to, you know, to have the HTML page object is to have a non-mutable object that you can't have anything coming in, like right up to the last minute with you know, a hook page alter and changing anything you want, right? Because then you have, you, you, it's a complete cache busting scenario and you have no predictable page model. And we still you know, have this system where we're just pushing shit out, right? You know, it's back to that, that other anti-pattern which is very you know, common in Drupal where you're loading a giant array of doom. And you're like, oh, I need this, I need this. Thank you for loading this giant thing and now I just need this. We're pushing all that out there. It's un unnecessary, unneeded because we don't really know what's needed. So um, this is... Uh, you know, kind of getting, getting back on the path of a predictable page model is now going on on a fork. It's, I don't know at what point it's going to actually going to be shaped at the point where it can be a, a contrib module plugged in. Um, from the princess to the unicorn, the unicorn actually is something that we, that we can get in as a contrib module without completely forking the underlying data model. Um, and how, uh, well, what the unicorn is, is you start with your page, HTML twig, right? And you add everything you want directly to it, to your theme, right? So you control your blocks and layouts from the theme layer. So if, if Princess and the display, uh, uh, which is not really a module, but, but if the but, but Princess display like system or fork as, as it will, um, is um, you know, kind of on the one side, um, controlling your blocks and, uh, blocks and the theme layer is kind of like the holy grail, right? It's, this is why it's called the unicorn. This is what all themers, I think, really where they want to, where they want to get to is now, the, now you're completely demuxed from the back end. Not only, not only is, not, is the back end not doing an inception on your markup, not only are you not having to dive into these, you know, PHP and all this, all this crap, sorry, um, all this stuff, but now you actually have full control over, you know, the look of your site, your templating, the full front end from the front end, right? How does this, well, how, do, how does this work? How, you know, how does the unicorn work? Well, wait, we're passing in a block configuration from the theme layer, right? So you pass in the block configuration from the theme layer. So does anyone see that, that there might be a problem in there? This would, be, this would be a good opportunity for to win the design book. Because, okay, so now if you have the block configuration being passed in from the theme layer, and the back end is passing the block configuration to the UI. So now all of a sudden the UI, if you actually use the UI, where, which, is, which is which, right? Like what does the UI present to you? The configuration as it's being injected in the back end? Or, so, um, you know, the solution that really is to maybe disable the, the UI. So this is, um, uh, this is a project that's uh, mostly being worked on by uh, uh, Fabian. Uh, X, not Fabian Potencia, of the, of the, twi of the uh, who, wrote, who wrote Twig. And so that, it'll, I assume there's going to be some, something in a fairly workable fashion by maybe Austin. Um, although, you know, that's like, you know, saying that Drupal 8 will be out by Austin. So, um, now, um, there are, so, 
you know, that's a little bit about, you know, the twig, what we got in, um, for twig specifically, the kind of higher level, like, where the theming system needs to go that didn't get in, um, and then there are some things that we thought for sure we were going to get in um, that turns out didn't get in. So, for example, the new theme hooks um, that we're going to replace the weird preprocess layer um, include hook theme prepare, theme prepare alter, suggestions hook, and theme suggestions alter, um, except that as of, like, not even two weeks ago, uh, the prepare, prepare hooks are not going, are not going to be in. But um, the idea here is that right now, preprocess layer is weird and unpredictable. We need a way to actually uh, pass, pass suggestions, pass suggestions in. Um, so whereas, and whereas you previously, and, I, and again, because this is so fast changing, this just changed like on, uh, Actually, it's, actually, I think it's been close, close to a month now. So whereas before, you would, uh, just take, you would just change the, vari the suggestions in the variables array, right? The idea is to make it a hook, an actual hook that actually does that. I do not know, actually, um, at one point, you could not use, you, you couldn't uh, change, change it in the, in the variables array anymore. And I don't know if that gets reverted now that the prepare hooks, prepare hooks are out. But, um, you know, obviously this is going to be a big API change for, it's an API change, so this is not something that can go in uh, like a dot release, right? So this has to be postponed till 9. Um, so the, the D8 uh, theming system, as it was, and I think this is really useful to look at where we wanted to be with this. Um, like what we wanted, what we wanted the theme system. So this is the, the, the phases of the Drupal 8 theme system that were planned for the past year, like up until maybe a month ago. And so this, this does change. But it, it gives you some, some insight, because we're essentially completing the work that we started in 7. And we're finishing the work. So you have building the registry, altering your callback suggestions, two layers of preparing and altering the variables, and then rendering your output. Um, first one is, is, pretty, is, is, is very stable, defining your callbacks, default arcs, and templates. You, the modules and themes actually do add the hook theme suggestions. That's in because, I mean, that stays in. That's actually put in to resolve uh, kind of a, a bug where, uh, I, guess, I guess one thing that's really important to mention is, so what, what we're doing is we're taking the theme layer and we're making it conform to a, an API that's essentially form API. Like, this is, becomes, becomes the model. Like, why would you have multiple ways of doing things? You want to have, like, one consistent way of doing things, of creating render arrays, of passing them around, um, and a consistent API. Um, and then, so, so if you implement, if you implement, like, you know, hook form, form ID, alter, but you don't implement a hook form alter, that's a problem. There's a bug in there. So, so and this is what hook theme suggestion be used for, and that will stay in. So prepare, prepare is out, but the suggestions are in. So, and then there's um, the priorities are turned by, by a, a single theme stack, which starts with modules, goes to themes, and then goes to the stack. Uh, so, the idea then uh, was hook theme suggestions alter, and theme suggestions alter, template suggestion alter, replaces uh, the preprocess uh, uh, altering. And, you see, you know, and then hook theme prepare, however, is, um, is out, and theme prepare template suggestion is out. And, so this is the sad story of, oh, where did it go? Like, <laughs> it's gone, right? So, however, um, still, still looking at a model of Drupal moving from a theming system to a rendering system. The idea that front-end developers and front-end designers come to Drupal, we're like, oh, well, now you have to do this thing called theming. And theming means you have to get into this weird inner zone between the back end and the front end because they're not completely demoxed, demultiplexed, right? And you have to get in there and kind of work with this weird preprocess layer that's just one of these, of this kind of like some subsection of that, you know, overall theming diagram we saw. And, we, and you have to also learn PHP, you know, um, to do all this. But it's not just, I mean, it's not just PHP. It's Drupal's very weird implementation of the preprocess layer. We're, and that, we want all that to go away. Right? Like, why do we want to subject, is this like some secret handshake that we want to subject like designers and front-end developers to? I, you know, I don't think so, right? We want to make it clean and easy and work so that, you know, you could have uh, someone on your team that's moving very effortlessly before, between like Django 
and Drupal, right? And so it's not some special convoluted weird like framework that you need to have all this like intimate knowledge of, but it works very consistently in, in a manner befitting modern web applications. Um, you know, as far as whether the backend renderables should be handled as uh, arrays or objects, again, that's not, a, that's not a question that needs to happen. So effectively for, um, you know, for, for writing your themes, obviously, uh, or, you know, if you've looked into it at all, you know, the theme info is now a YAML file, uh, the template PHP is, uh, is now a, a theme file, and all of your templates become HTML twig files, all of the theme functions go away. Uh, defining, so if you're defining regions, just an example of how you do it in twig, I don't know why the cache, cache setting is there, that's probably on the wrong slide. Um, and then most importantly of all is, is now, in terms of adding assets, AdJS is deprecated, right, because it totally breaks encapsulation. Right? There's just no, no way of, and, and you can end up with no more cache busting scenarios. You shouldn't. Does everyone kind of get that we do, that we unofficially, informally do this two step dance where other, maybe uh, other platforms have an actual deprecation model where something's officially deprecated and then you, it exists for one version and then the next version it's removed. So there's like a two step dance where you're always like, in this version, like odd numbers, even numbers, you're not supposed to use it, but then the next version it's gone. So we sort of do that, it's not official. So. I mean, who here is, is already aware that, like, in 7, you're not really supposed to be using this? I think, I think that <laughs> the lack of the number of hands that go up in the room, you know, speaks to, like, just how unofficial that kind of model is. But, you know, the idea is that you were supposed to be using attached and form API for this in a way that actually gives us a predictable model and moves us one step forward to a rendering model with predictable, with predictable page model with knowing the assets. Um, so this is... Uh, just, just an example of um, you know, something you, you don't want to do, because um, instead you want to, and this is, uh, this works for, um, this is for eight, it works for seven, so you want to add JS using a renderable array, so this is in this case, I'm adding an external file to, uh, to the Radix theme, which is the base theme for, for Panopoly. And then, render in your, temp in, your, uh, in your Twig template, right? So you just add it to the render array, and then um, on the front end, so this is, about as, this is about as ugly as it gets. I mean, this is pretty much probably the ugliest slide we've seen. Um, and, and because preprocess is staying in, there's going to be more instances of, of ugliness in the theme layer. Um, but on the front side, it's, it's, su it's super clean. Um, just some syntax changes, um, not really worth going into. Slides, slides will be up if you ever need it. Um, interesting enough, there seems to be a complete lack of JavaScript documentation for 8, although um, what Nod was able to do is because we're using uh, doc blocks and Doxygen, he was able to just able to scrape uh, this entire site um, that, he that he has up at Drupal J uh, JS API just from the doc blocks, right? And it's actually really, really informative. Um, debugging is something that is going to require a lot of memory, but if you set debug to true, you will get an immense amount of output. Um, you can also dump any variable just by uh, dump as a function, in, is a twig function that's uh, right now in, in Drupal and you can use that. And all this gets us to a, to a model where we turn Drupal from a theming system into a rendering system. Theme functions go away, become a private method called by Drupal render, it's replaced by render arrays. So you actually, you create the render array and then return the fully rendered HTML and you never ever have to render anything again. Just print it, you just print everything. Everything is just printed using, using the twig tag. Um, so I guess the remaining question then becomes, will we have an object-oriented API for, for, for Drupal render? Um, so Drupal converting render to an actual service could happen as early as 8.3. That's not necessarily a hard problem to get in. Converting the render API to be completely object-oriented, that's not going to happen anytime soon, famous last words. But um, things, uh, you know, I mean, we, we want things should not be rendered as markup you know, until the theme layer has, has its say, right? Like, everything in the theme layer has to, has to, have to one of the, you know, one of the several hard problems is that everything in the theme layer has to fire before, before, uh, before, anything, before anything rendered. Um, but converting the render system to object orientation essentially means converting form API to objects, and that's why I say it's not going to happen soon. So I guess what we're saying is, you know, everything's, you know, it seems to be a, a fairly rosy picture. Things didn't get in, but what we're saying is that we have a much cleaner system, that it's much easier to use, that it doesn't require like these kind of twisted convolutions. Um, 
And it's going to definitely require like unlearning certain patterns that you know that you probably shouldn't have like had like stick in your brain in the first place and learning cleaner patterns. But it seems to me there's still a problem. And that is that you have all of these sites out there that are already written in the old system, right? So what are you gonna do? I mean, so, and this is, this is a problem that um, actually I wrestled with quite a bit in how to solve it. And for me, it touched on the heart of like the, you know, open source problems and Drupal development in general and trying to like, you know, cat herd everyone into like chopping problems up into small size pieces and everyone repeating like, so, if everyone here has Drupal you know, 7 and even 6 themes that you're maintaining, you know, clients and your own, th and you need to upgrade all of those to 8, and we know that all of those mappings are fairly well known. I mean, this, this is, I mean there's not a lot of wiggle room there. It's just everyone now, you're all doing, you're literally, t everyone in the room converting your themes, you're typing the same characters in, right? You're doing the same conversions with just, it's templatized, right? I mean. In Drupal 7, it's kind of a messy template, and I use, that, use the polite version of that word. Um, and now it's a cleaner version in Drupal 8, but it's still templatized, right? So we should be able to then build a module which takes Drupal 7 themes and automatically converts them to Drupal 8. So that module is currently in my sandbox, and it works. Um, I've kept up. I'm not up to um, the uh, uh, latest alpha, which is alpha 9, although alpha 10 is ready to come out. Um, where we'll, uh, uh, Drupal add libraries is deprecated, and that's now, that's now in YAML. Um, but uh, so um, I've, I've, I've ran it on Radix and convert Radix uh, to 8. Uh, in fact, um, the, the busy theme, if anyone's ever seen that, I have a friend in China, they were using the busy theme, um, and they had converted it manually to 8, and I installed it, and there were errors, like just errors everywhere. And so I ran, I used uh, Twigify to convert it, and there are no errors, right? So, and, so, and I encourage everyone to uh, go to my sandbox, grab the module, run it on your themes, get in the issue queue, report any errors, any, any errors you find, and I am trying to keep up with, with the latest alpha to make sure that it works to convert, to convert your, uh, uh, all, all the modules. And, and then the idea is, so, it, you know, it's not, it's not perfect. So what it does is, it, it, you know, it, it runs over all of, the, all, of the, all of the template functions and theme functions, all the templates and all the, th basically the theme hooks, and runs and converts everything that it can convert. And then anything it can convert, it's going, to con it's going to mark as a twig comment and put that aside. And then the plan is to have an auditing tool in there too um, that actually then tells you, oh, you have like 17 theme functions that for some reason can't be converted, basically. You know, you have something, something quirky in there. Um, so that is pretty much, I think that's, about the, all the time we have for an overview of the Drupal 8 theme system. Questions? Yeah, so, um, you know, various people have, have tried to, to, to figure out ways to do that. And, you know, you can kind of like wrestle it into the, through, you know, through, you know, through the back door of JavaScript. Um, but the problem is, is that the theme layer is baked into the module system. And so whereas you can swap the theme layers out at the, at, you know, at the theme level, um, you can't do it at the, at the hook level. And so it's, it's, that's really not going to happen. You, that brings up the really interesting question um, about decoupling Drupal. Because if you, I mean, if you, everyone knows what decoupling Drupal is, it's the idea of using Drupal for as a CMS in the back end and getting it independent from whatever you're using in the front end. So your front end could be anything that's hitting the service. You know, it could be a, a framework such as Angular or whatever. Uh, and then the idea there is now you've just built your application, your front end application in Angular like or whatever you have, and you can build that for seven. And then when eight comes out, you don't touch your front end because it's not even Drupal anymore. The, the thing there is, though, now you're not using the Drupal theme system anymore. Right? Now you're completely bypassing Twig. And I think we're going to, I think we're going to see some people are going to be going the Twig route and some people are going to be going the decoupled Drupal route. And it'll be two kind of like... Well, Twig is, in, yeah, Twig, so Twig is, Twig is independent in the sense um, that it will, it's never, it's never going to be tightly coupled, right? But it's, but it's independent. I mean,
Absolutely. Well, absolutely. I mean, the original question is about seven, which is, which is a hard problem to solve. But, in, but using Twig, that's the whole point. We don't have an idiosyncratic theming system in order. We have a templating system that can be used across other, PH, other PHP frameworks and is very, very similar to uh, templating frameworks used in other languages. Yeah, except that's a hard problem to solve. <laughs> Right, and, and it's also not worth, worthwhile to solve. Like, it's much more important to figure out how we can get ACETIC in um, and use ACETIC to, for all our asset handling. Um, and if we could get that in, that's, that gives us much more forward momentum. And as, as far as, con I, mean, I mean, actually, I mean, I feel like this Twigify makes that, prob makes that problem go away, right? So you're, you're, now you're, you're saying, well, problem solved that way, let's solve it a different way. Problem solved, move on, harder problems. Last chance for questions. The what? Um, it's, it's, there's some, there's some hard problems, there's some hard problems in there because uh, if you want to, I mean, like, like I think I mentioned earlier, it's, you know, it's a big difference between whether you want to attach assets to a route or an actual thing like a block, you know, that may have a view and may call it, uh, you know, someone pointed out, like, you know, you could have a, inside of there, a Google Maps. I mean, basically the problem you're trying to solve is you have to fully, have a fully rendered object. We have this recursive model, and it's going to require a big change. Um, I mean, I think it's pretty dicey whether it's going to get in, but there's, it's being worked on. I mean, I don't know if I answered the question. The, the, the answer is, it's a hard problem. I don't know if it's going to get in a dot release, but it's really important. People are definitely working on it. That looks like it. Thanks.